Well, today we're introducing an amazing songwriter and very nice guy, Chris Braid. Now, I'm going to mention some of the people he's worked with because um, Dad can read, but he doesn't know who any of them are. So <laughs> I feel like I can import if I say them. I'm glad you said I could read. <laughs> I just thought, in case anyone was worried. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Chris Brown has worked with Sia, Lana Del Rey, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Selena Gomez, David Guetta, Halsey, Rabel, Mark Almond, Beth Ditto, Yuna, and Beyonce. So, those are some of the people. <laughs> Do any of those names mean anything to you, Dad? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I should have let you do it. Well, no, no, I'm glad you did, because you said you already had a, a number of his songs on your iTunes. Yeah, without realising, when I was looking at all the people he's worked with and set them the songs partic in particular that he wrote, yeah, lots of them are on my, on my phone, which was pretty <laughs> exciting. Well, I, I met um, Chris because he worked with Jeff Downs and um, they together have the Downs braid association and they've i've just done three album covers for them well over a similar number of years and the latest one is just coming out and i do this and show you except i don't have a copy yet but in the in the interview chris does hold it up so you'll see it yeah it, it was very nice it was very good chat. I liked it and very interesting to find out his approach to writing and working. I found it really amazing because so one of the things that I'm doing at the moment is I'm doing a workshop for the Royal Society of the Arts in the summer where three creative people are going to get together and do workshops on how to come up with ideas in their respective fields and we had an architect, a fashion designer and me and we were all going to then have a final workshop where we discuss the things we have in common in coming up with ideas and the things that are different. And what I found extraordinary about listening to Chris Braid and how his process works is it's almost exactly how we come up with paintings, isn't it? He has yeah. sketches and, and he feels excited about the demo as a sort of living, breathing, dynamic thing, as opposed to the polished final album. And that's like your sketchbook as, a, or, you know, a sort of fluid sketch as opposed to the final painting. And that just so many things I would never have expected um, coming up with music, creating music and creating artwork to have in common. Yeah. Yeah. And that you have to have the faith that those ideas will come. It doesn't work to go too panicky and scrut and, and too much of a, uh, a search for them. It's better to wait, let them come. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be a, a universal process, but it's always interesting to hear different people's nuances on how that process works for them. Yeah, it was really, I think, like, I've, I've got an exhibition coming up in the summer, and sometimes when I'm trying to get into the zone of coming up with ideas, hearing how other people create, I find a bit distracting and difficult, and I just want to focus in. But this was one of those conversations, which was just such a relief to have someone say so many of those things that you have in common. And he seems like just so nice and relaxed about everything as well. <laughs> Someone who just really enjoys what they do for coming up with something good as yeah. opposed to having any after effect of what he's making, yeah. which I'm not interested in hearing about. <laughs> I just want to hear how someone really enjoys the process. Yes. Well, he, he, interesting too is he lives not very far away from us. And in, um, it's interesting because I've never met him since he's lived in England. I, I only met him when he was living in California and visiting England. 
we'll have to have tea one time because you can't have all of these conversations to yourself indefinitely. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Yes. Yeah. But um, I wanted to just sorry, sorry, just a little note. When you guys were talking and you were saying some artist beginning with SH was wearing your t shirt, it was Shakira. Ah, yes, that's right. Yeah. Sorry, you were going to say something. <laughs> No, my brain used to be like being in a library and I know what everything was. Now I have to <laughs> struggle through the card index and see SH still looking. Sorry? You need to get yourself a little brain iPad with apps and icons and albums. Well, it's that the library's got so much bigger, not because the brain is so much slower. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that I was going to say is um, Chris Braid's Wi-Fi, I guess because he lives near you, and that seems to be how things roll there, is a bit dodgy at the beginning, but it smooths out and gets better. So just press on through that little glitchy bit and it will be fine after that. Well, I'm not going to moan about BT. It's one of those don't get me started subjects. <laughs> what do you mean you're not going to? You're not, again, after talking to Chris Braid about it or now? When are you oh, not going to? <laughs> hmm. Well, there was one more thing that I wanted to say to everybody. And this is something that Dad and I are consistently bad at, but would be so grateful if you would, uh, if you're enjoying these talks, if you would subscribe to the YouTube channel and rate and review, if you have a moment, um, that would really help us out. We heard that Facebook are not promoting things that aren't kind of paid for anymore. So every time this comes out, it's not automatically going into people's feeds. So if you want to make sure you're keeping up to date with the podcast and the live videos and painting, then if you subscribe on the YouTube channel and the Apple Podcasts, you'll definitely get everything as soon as it comes yeah, out. There's no we charge. Have... Yeah, no charge. Everything's free. Um, and we just love to see more people come join the community. Yes, please join. And now we have Chris Braid, an amazing, nice guy and an amazing writer, composer. Bye. Okay. So, so I guess the thing yeah. that I'm just going to talk about is where do the ideas come from and how do you capture them? Right. And just before you hit record, I was talking about the songs on Halcyon Hymns. Um, and I was saying that, um, you know, those ideas seem to just present themselves. It, it seemed like it, it was the right time to to write those songs. It, you know, the world was in a flux. I'd just been in the UK, we'd flown back to LA, everything suddenly changed. It was quite clear that things were different. My studio was empty, everything was cancelled, you know. God, what the hell, what, what am I going to do? And then these, it was like these songs just said, write these songs, you know. And it's not sort of, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, I suppose, it's not, I'm not a fantasist. I know that it's a real thing. I have to sit there and work at them and, and finish them and chip away at them. But the actual spark, I think it presented itself. I really believe in that kind of, you know, whether it's divine intervention or whatever you want to call it. Sometimes the muse comes to play and it sort of says, you know, you need to do this. <laughs> it will make you feel better. <laughs> I like to think. And do you think in, I mean, is the music simultaneous to the words or does one come before the other? How does that work? It depends, really, I suppose, um, with these things, because they st those songs in particular started from little germs that Jeff Downs had sent to me. I had a folder full of things and I thought I'll get to those at some point. I'll work on those, but it's not the right time now. I've got things that I've got to get out of the way. But then this happened, blah, blah, blah. So. Lots of time on my hands. I thought this is perfect now to open this folder of, of bits. Yeah. So I started chipping away at the music and then got into, you know, just being 
in love with write, writing words, if you like, uh, separate from the music. And that's great as well. I really enjoy that. I mean, I think I'd, I'd always say I'm a musician before I'm a lyricist, but actually when you get in the zone, it can be just great. I'd sit on the, uh, we had, I was living in LA when I wrote those songs, and we had four kind of loungers outside on the deck. And I would just sit there in the sunshine, you know, which is ever present and just write words without the music. Right. You know, a, a vague melody that I've been working on and the meter in my head and I'll just write the words. It's really fun to do that and just get away from the studio and, a, and an instrument hmm. and just be a words person, you know, for a minute. So I like both things for different reasons, but I don't know when it happens. It just, when you're in the mood, but you can make yourself be in the mood, of course. How do you do that? I think it's like sort of starting at one of those old cars from the forties, isn't it? Sometimes you just have to, <laughs> <laughs> you just have to start, don't you? It's very easy to say, well, I'm not in the mood today. I don't want to write another song or, you know, I'll just stay in bed or watch, watch the TV or whatever. But mm. if you start, you get that motor running, can't you? And then, Suddenly you can, oh, this, okay, I like this. Yeah, this is good. I have to make myself sometimes. With those, I didn't have to make myself. It was just, I couldn't wait to get out of the house and into the studio and just get going, work on them. And I, that's my favorite kind of creative life. When, yeah. when you're not doing it for any other reason other than just the pure, you know, excitement of it, love of it. Yeah. I wish that was every day. Your sound, the sound is getting a bit strange. It sort of comes and goes. Yeah. I'm a bit um, out in the middle of nowhere with Wi-Fi from 1984. Ah, so. right. When I first did this, I was complaining bitterly about BT and how rubbish it was because we paid for a signal that was supposed to be 13 megabytes upload and 25 download. And we were getting, if we were lucky, 1.2 or 0.3, you know, less than a megabyte. Yeah. And at seven o'clock in the yeah. evening, nothing very often. And um, that's right. I got, I got contacted by somebody who said, oh, BT do these mini hubs that you can use anywhere. And uh, they said they'll give you a hundred megabytes. And I thought, my God, heaven. And I got one, but we have um, aluminum foil in the insulation. So that inhibits the signal. But I, I get 15 if I, you know, on a good yeah. day, 15. So you need one of those. Oh, it sounds like, um, yeah, it sounds like luxury. You know, I'm sending, um, files i sent a file yesterday to los angeles and it took you know like four hours or something <laughs> it was yeah. something that should normally take five minutes <laughs> yes so well, you, yeah you sorry know. everyone and, and roger about terrible wi-fi <laughs> you're not planning to stay there so it's not <laughs> worth putting a lot of effort into a proper solution no um, not really. I mean, we weren't planning to stay here longer than two weeks, actually, but, you know, <laughs> best laid plans and all that. Right. That was a few months ago. Right. It was a few months ago. Right? I've got kids, you know, and they're starting to say, um, is there a plan? <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I guess, the plan. I guess I wandered what? into that Wi-Fi thing because the sound went weird. But at the point you were talking about, you were talking about that incredible enthusiasm and energy to be doing it. And yes, yeah, that is something to be treasured. I, I find that if I'm working on a picture and I can see, I can do something that would be amazing. You know, the next brush stroke, the next hundred brush strokes are gonna be really exciting. That's when I stop for the night so that in the morning, I'm just desperate to get back to it. Yeah, that's fantastic. What a great thing 
and also to know when you when that feeling you know that feeling is there and to be savored you know well it's quite magical really it's kind of crashes in on you doesn't it it doesn't it... yeah i think that's why you know sometimes i hear of uh, you know people will say over the years i'll say well we went to a house in devon and we just you know we booked it for three weeks and wrote the songs for the album or something I've never actually done that, but I can see how that could be beneficial just to get away from the quotidian, you know, and just everything, just people and just be in your own space and just, you know, just do that thing. I must do that at some point. Because <laughs> I think it'd be quite nice. <laughs> yes, in <laughs> fact, away from the world. they did that. They got a house in Devon, which Steve still owns, still works in. That's yeah, I, I heard. I just read Steve's biography actually, it's very interesting. Yes, yes. I suppose you're thinking you can leave that a couple more years, maybe a couple more decades before you do your well, own. Yeah, oh yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, he's lived a, a rather interesting and fabulous life, hasn't he? And I was amazed actually reading it and just thinking, wow, you know, the talk about commitment. I mean, that guy's committed. Yes. Amazing. Yes. And amazingly clever. Yeah, brilliant. Um, we, we were talking about writing and you were talking about uh, the lyric. <clears throat> Your CV has you working with an incredible number of people. How does that work when you're working with other people? Do you write on your own or do you write with them? I write with them and, you know, tend to, you know, lucky enough these days that I can, I suppose, you know, be a bit choosy about who I work with. And so if I'm working with someone like the obvious person I would think of is Sia because I've worked a lot with her over the years <clears throat> and she is so brilliant. I mean, she is really the real deal in terms of, you know, just talent and, creativity and and intellect as well because you know that's important you know when you're writing good lyrics and and harmony and so I will sit at the piano with her and you know usually write the music and and the melody sort of hook lines and things I tend to sort of play piano like I'm singing the melody a lot of my piano parts are like that the melody will be part of the thing you know and so she will pick up on, and we wrote a song called Big Girls Cry, which a lot of her fans like. And, um, you know, the melody on the piano is do, 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 do. And she just wrote Big Girls Cry when their hearts are breaking, you know. So she fit the lyric to the, the little jingle, if you like. And so we tend to write like that. I won't go near the lyrics because if she's the, you know, whoever's the artist, they should be doing that part of it I think I mean I'll chip in with things right. but I think if you're the singer you should be singing your own words that's how I feel anyway it should be a kind of personal thing otherwise it doesn't feel authentic to me I mean yeah, but they'll say you know what do you think of this line or have you got a better line well yeah what about this you know and I'll I'll edit but I think I tend to be the musician in those scenarios and write the music right. so what other venues do you have for your own songs besides DBA? I mean, I've done solo things. I was part of the producers with Trevor Horn and Steve Lipson for years. I wrote all those songs. Um, you know, I'll do sort of bits of things. I mean, there are times when I'll write songs for other people and, and write the, you know, the whole thing. But I tend to like, if I'm, you know, if I'm not doing bits of solo things or DBA or, or This Oceanic Feeling was another side project I had with Ash Stone from the producers. I, I tend to sort of be a bit, um, you know, like managers will say, what the hell are you working on now? What bonkers project have you conjured up now? You know, but I don't like to get bored. And I don't think you should, if you're creative, <laughs> I don't think you should waste it. I mean, I, I don't take any day for granted and, and, and the ability to create something. I never take it for granted. So after this conversation or you know, a couple of hours, I may just sit at the piano and conjure something up just to have something to play with. You said you've so never... I'm always doing some... 
You said you'd never really suffered from writer's block. Not so much, no. I mean, there are days where I think, well, that's not as good as it could be, or... Mm. And really, it's not, it's not so much the fear of writer's block, it's more the fear of the feeling of maybe not feeling like doing it. That's the fear, I think, for me, you know. Mm. What if you just stopped feeling like doing it forever? That's <laughs> kind of scary. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, have you thought of that? Not getting excited about doing something else instead? Yeah, I mean, what you mean, like just going off and being a, a farmer or something, right? You know, <laughs> not a farmer, but yeah. But yeah, some, yeah. But I think that's the thing, the psychological side of it is interesting to me as much as the music these days, probably because of the age I'm at. But it's funny that we start off in life as our teachers or our parents put these labels on us. I mean, your name's a label for a start. That, yeah, I didn't choose my name, you know, it was chosen for me. And then, then your teachers choose what you're good at, you know, even though that may not be the case and they've just missed something. Then your parents go, oh, he's good at that. That's what he is, he's, he's the musician. And suddenly you go around you, your whole life thinking, well, I'm this and I do that. And so that's who I am. But that's not necessarily true. I don't think my age now, my sort of, you know, 40s, you can do anything, can't you? You can be anything, really. And it's never too late. To... No, I, 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 I think that. Um, it seems to me that part of the education system is also, it has that narrowing and focusing effect. And ultimately, I don't think that's helpful. I think... No, you, absolutely. When I talk to my daughter about going to art school, I said that, you know, learn to draw and learn to make stuff. And then it doesn't really matter what you do. And that's yeah. how I felt about my education. You know, it was, I can do what I want. Obviously, if I'm going to do something I've never done, there's going to be a new learning curve. But, mm. you know, holding the pencil and letting the ideas flow seems to be applicable to such a wide range of things. It, it seemed kind of crazy yeah. to say, okay, I design mugs. I might. Yeah. But I might <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. Well, absolutely. You're boxed very quickly, aren't you? I think in, this, in, this, in the school, the traditional school system. They yeah. work out who you are and they, they, they number you very quickly. And, and I don't want that for my children either. I mean, I think what you said to your daughter is absolutely what I've said to my kids. You know, just play an instrument, just paint, draw, do, just make stuff because you'll never regret it. And nobody's ever turned around to me and said, well, I really regret learning to play the guitar or the piano or ah. painting. No one's yeah. ever said that. <laughs> no. You know. Yeah. And so. it's, um, my view on that is that, um, hand-eye coordination, whether you're playing a violin or a guitar or painting or drawing, it takes up so much real estate in the brain that it is mm. great mental exercise to be doing it all the time. Absolutely. For whatever purpose, it's like just keeping fit. <laughs> mentally. Yeah, oh, definitely. Absolutely. You know, there was a funny thing recently because my little boy, he's 12 and he's not been sort of that great at maths. He's a great drummer, but he's not great at maths. And uh, he's, we were having one of those parent sort of teacher parent, you know, Zoom conference things. And she was saying, well, he's not very, you know, he's not great at doing this part and he should really, you know, concentrate on his t t times tables and basically giving, giving him a bit of a, a roasting. And I said to Olivia, I said, you know what, I'd love to go back and say, yeah, you're right, he needs to work on that. And, you know, we just want to just sort of uh, switch, you know, roles for a minute. We'd like to set you a task and it's, um, we're going to send you a copy of Logic Pro, which is a, you know, a music software program. And you've got as much time as you like all year to come up with a song and demo it. <laughs> <laughs> and then she would say, well, that's not what I do. I don't know. I, I don't do that. I don't. Yes, but you could learn. It just takes some time, you know. And he's like, he's 12, you know. And it's amazing how they, they go, well, he's not good at math. So that's that. There's your little dot, you know, Sasha, not good at maths. 
And that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. It is. We're all good at something. It's almost invariably not true. There's probably nobody who couldn't be taught maths. So it, there must be a fault in the teaching to get someone excited by it. It's like learning to drive. I think drawing is like learning to drive. Pretty much anyone can do it. Some people can do it incredibly well, but nearly everybody yeah. can do it at a level that will get them from A to B. I mean, that's interesting you say that because I, for me, it's not a natural thing. So, you know, I look at the work that you do and it, I, I, it's mind blowing. I, I, I don't know how it's done. And I'd love to be able to even come close to, you know, being able to enjoy that, but I don't know how you do it. But you did it once. That's the thing. It's part of how we, how we learn to see, for example, is, is make marks, symbols. Yeah. And strangely enough, our eyes are not brilliant optical instruments. It's done by the brain, mostly. So the brain is getting these substandard signals and it uses a huge computing power to make an image. And, you know, you see babies hold things, put them in their mouths. They're learning to identify what they see. So yeah. they have a visual thing. And when they do a squiggle and say, that's mum, they're seeing mum. And if you say, mum mm, doesn't have green hair, does she? Oh, okay, they change it. it but they're still seeing it because the brain yeah, is maybe. doing the seeing, not the eye. So once you would have done this naturally. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's whatever is pulled out of you, I suppose, early on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of half joking about this, but. My schooling was chaotic because my dad was in the army and I went to 16 different schools. My brother went to 18. Wow. And I have a feeling that when I ended up at Ashford Grammar School, they pushed me towards art or didn't dissuade me, whatever, because they thought the rest of my schooling was so rubbish. Maybe that's what I should do. So wow. It's kind of an odd default. So, oh, fantastic. Well, maybe. I, 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 I liked it. I loved the idea of it. When I was a kid, I liked the idea of designing the future. So, and drawing natural history subjects. So that was my motivation. Our school turned out to be... I good. always think that... Go on. Sorry. I always think that your work looks futuristic, even, even if there's a nostalgia about it. It's interesting. <laughs> It's sort of like, I was, I was like, I'd like to, you know, I suppose a lot of people have said this to you, but I kind of wish that the world was like how you see it, you know, it's, it's much more beautiful. Although, you know, there's some beauty out there right now in West Sussex with the horses and stuff, but there's a lot of beauty in it. And I kind of always sort of hoped that, you know, somehow there was a place that we could visit that was like that. Maybe there are, there are lots of places. I mean, I walk sometimes through the forest on this farm where we're staying and I see the um, the green mossy sort of um, uh, roots of trees and I think Roger must have seen that and he must have gone home and painted it you know I yeah, don't know if you, but you're I, right you're, you're really right I've done that so often I mean the, some tree roots in particular look amazing because um, there's a uh, what's it called hornbeam which looks like a beech tree but it looks like a beech tree that's gone crazy. It gets all twisty and gnarled. Mm. It looks weirdly muscular, but yeah. it, it's got a smooth bark, but they were used round here a lot because they um, made a very good wood for iron smelting. Playing from Roger Dean's MacBook Pro. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, because they burned at a high temperature and they're very hard wood. So they're used for cogwheels in the old windmills, for example. Oh, right. But they're also lining pathways that have gradually over the years sunk. So the root systems right. are, appear to be going higher and higher. 
and they are incredibly tangled and mysterious. Well, I saw one yesterday and I was with Olivia, we went for a walk and I said, look at that, it's, it's like a world. And it was, it was exactly as you described, the, the war, there was water, a little stream kind of running, but it had eroded away, obviously over time. And it was just these big chunky kind of gnarled, you know, roots with the green all around it. And it was like, it's, it was like a world. If you could just, look, I'll take a photo of it and send it to you. because it, 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 I just thought, I bet, you, I bet you'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet anyone would, wouldn't they? Yeah, nature, amazing. Yes. I'm, it's interesting. I was very interested when I left college. I was doing design more than, I had no notion of ending up doing painting. Uh, I still would like to be doing more design. Um, really? I love painting, but I still can't get it out of my head that it's a, it's, it's a kind of a hobby that's taken over rather than <laughs> what I want to be doing. Um, Architecture design or, or? Yeah, I guess that's really where I am. Yeah. Your album cover's just got a piece in it. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think that's one of my favorite things I've seen for a, a long time. Actually, I'm not just saying that, but it's just gorgeous. And the the blue of the bird and the oh. logo. And, oh, I could eat it. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Well, yeah, I, I love walking in the landscape. It's it's like a prayer. It's incredibly inspirational. And the stuff you're talking about, you know, you see some mossy old root and it, there's a world there. Yeah. It's at Absolutely. a scale, but it's, it can be a whole world. I found actually being here, you know, coming back from LA, lived there for 10 years, come back. We're in this temporary situation on a, on a stud farm. And I found that I've been, like a lot of people during this pandemic, I've walked a lot, you know, so that's been great. But I found that I'd, I've liked being outside more than inside, probably because it's not my home, but also I've just rediscovered the love of being outside. Maybe it's, I'm back in the landscape that I know so well and familiar, but I could, it almost reminds me of when I was a kid. You never wanted to go in. You wanted to stay out all day and night. And it, I feel a little bit like that again. I, if the stuff's getting to me or the worry about where we're going to ha have a house or all that sort of stuff, all the kids, I just go out and it always feels better. And I've realized that that is actually it's a very powerful thing to just get out into nature and just be have, okay with it. Have you read the books by Robert McFarlane? He, he's written a number about walking and pathways. Mm -hmm. You think, hmm, sounds it could be boring. And they're not. They're beautiful books. Oh, really? So okay. Check them out. I will. And he has a great life. He's basically from your guess from his name from Scotland, but he has walked around here, the South Downs Way and places like that. Beautiful. Yeah, it's magical. I like the idea of those books, definitely. Books are great like that as well, aren't they? Because they they are kind of a walk, if you like. Yeah. Sort of metaphorical. Walk. Yes. I mean, Escape. Lord of the Rings is essentially a, a protracted walk, isn't it? It's a quest. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So at the moment, I know this is the worst kind of question to ask somebody. Are you actually writing something new now or are you in between projects? How, how, what are you doing now? Yeah, I mean, I uh, was asked the other night, actually, it's funny because I hear I am back 5,000 miles away from where I've been for 10 years. And one of the people that I write quite regularly with emailed me and said, can you send me some some music? I just want to do some stuff. You know, I just want to be creative. So I've been working on that with a, a writer that I like a lot out there. Um, just piano things and a bit of strings, that kind of thing. Just more sort of kind of symphonic kind of piano things. Right. That she will do, hopefully do something over. So I've been doing something that's new, but I mean, you know, this this album 
is kind of fairly fresh. <laughs> so thank you for keep waving it around. <laughs> I know, yeah, I had to, you know. But it's fairly fresh, so I almost don't want to. Um, and Libby said it the other day. She said, "Don't move on too quickly," because that's what I'm. I tend to do, yeah. you know. Um, move on and just keep going because you know. Okay, what's next? Instead of savoring the moment, and I'm trying not to do that. I'm trying to just sort of live in the moment a little bit and and appreciate it because it's it's fresh. It's new. When is an album not new? I mean, is it after a week? Is it after three years? You know, it's. There's a tendency now to speed everything up. And I think it's my kids' generation are used to that. I mean, they listen to half a track now. They don't even listen to an album. And I try and say to them, sit with your headphones on, give yourself an hour and just listen to the whole thing from start to finish. Which is how we, you know, pre hopefully presented this album. It's meant to be like a book or a film, a beginning, middle and end. It's just an hour of your life you know, if that if you can spare that, just listen to it like we used to. You did, you never put, um, you know, I don't know, money on from Dark Side of the Moon. You put the whole thing on, didn't you? I mean, that was how I grew up listening to albums. The singles were the sort of advert, the Trojan horse, if you like, and then the album was the great event that you saved up for and headphones on, leave me alone for an hour. So I'm trying. I'm trying to just be in that moment as a listener as well and a creator, not move on too quickly. But I'll probably, you know, probably start writing in an hour. Don't you make that. compilations of your favorite tracks then? Do you only listen don't do to that. albums? I don't do that so much anymore. I mean, I used to do that, take yeah. things off the radio when I was a kid, but but I do like, I like the album as a, as a thing. I still, I'm still in love with the concept of the album. Kate Bush was interviewed not so long ago when she put out the last album, 50 Words for Snow, which is brilliant. And she said um, that she lamented the passing of the album because people yes. tend to not listen to albums in the same way. They cherry pick tracks or they'll download things from iTunes. And, like you say, make compilations. And yeah. she said she lamented the passing of it because it was, it was kind of a, a window into the artist's world. You were going on the ride with them. And you, you know, for that hour, you were listening to Peter Gabriel's, you know, neurosis for an hour or whatever, you know. Yes. Oh. <laughs> and I love, I like just going with them. I, uh, last week, well, it was actually longer ago, I talked to um, Stephen Fry and he talked about Wagner and the ring cycle is 16 hours. That is not a trivial sit down and <laughs> you inevitably have to take that in chunks, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Could you imagine if Wagner was around now, they'd be saying, can we just edit one Wagner for the radio? You know, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I must check that out actually, 16 hours, wow. Incredible. But there's lots of bits in it that are just mind-blowingly wonderful. Um, yeah. I, I'm not saying the whole thing isn't wonderful, but 16 hours is a challenge. That is That's a challenge. Are. Wasn't it Nietzsche that said that Wagner was when he realized that the meaning of life was God or something, or music was the meaning of life or something like that. I'm sure it was Wagner that Nietzsche heard and, and still had a revelation. Maybe some people will be watching this now going, no, you idiot. It was, you know, but I think it was Wagner, maybe. Yes. But Nietzsche saw, had this kind of epiphany that, ah, music. That's <laughs> the, <laughs> that's not a bad idea. That reminded me, coming back to the question, you were talking about writing songs. And when we talk about, we don't say creating song, we say writing or writing the words. You mean literally writing, don't you? With your hand on paper. Well, in my case, I do. Yeah, I don't like to type words. Uh, I know a lot of people do because they think it's convenient and you can edit quickly and, you know, scrub the line out. But I like the mistakes because sometimes you go back to a mistake and you go, actually, that's really good or half of it's good. But if yeah. you edit, mistakes out I mean unless you save multiple copies every time 
I like I like going I like looking back and thinking oh, actually that that's better. I just I didn't realize it at the time. So I still write with a pencil and paper. Absolutely. That's the words. What do you do with the music? Do you write that or do you only record that? Well, I don't write it down in a, on a manuscript because I can't read music and it, it doesn't make any sense particularly to me. And, right. And actually, um, you haven't invented your own system. You play it. I play it and it just remains in there. I'm, you know, fortunate I can remember. I mean, if you ask me to play you, uh, sit at the piano and play you, you know, the B side of, <laughs> I don't know, whatever single I liked in 1983, I probably could, because it just, I retain that kind of information. Yeah. But interesting for me, because I'll read a book and I think, what did I just read? And I have to read the page again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It takes me forever to read. I, I love reading, but I have to just, okay, I just need to take that in again, that page, you know. Yeah. I don't, it's a different kind of method of retaining information. Yes. Which was always a challenge at school. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I can see it's easily, yes. That was the thing, wasn't it? It wasn't what you read, it's what you retained that was the challenge. Well, Absolutely. I, I've been asked, um, do I keep a notebook by, by my bed in case I have an idea in the night? And I said that no, because I have lots of vaguely dreamlike nonsense. But if I have an idea yeah. that I want to retain, I do. I don't need to write it down. It's there when I'm ready to make use of it. And the other thing I do do is I keep all the mistakes, like you say. I have mm. masses of sketchbooks of what in one context was a mistake, but in some other future context, might be the start of something else, something new and something amazing. And yeah, I love that. I love exactly. looking at the old stuff when I can see it in a different way. Mm. Yeah, it's the objectivity, isn't it? It's really great sometimes. You know, I mean, go back to things on my hard drive from five years ago and think, oh, I like that now. But at the <laughs> time, it was like, nah, it's okay. <laughs> yes, because the context might have not been right for that piece, but it can become mm. right later. Yeah. 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 Very interesting. That's why you should always keep everything. I mean, I, I used to have DAT tapes full of things going back to, you know, the late 80s, actually, things from four tracks, eight tracks, demos, bits. You yeah. Know, I just keep everything like a hoarder because you never know, you know. And also, it's quite fascinating as you know for you know as the, as the creator i suppose you know to go back privately through your ramble of madness and sort of see what makes you tick i think it's quite interesting actually maybe not for other people but certainly i quite find it interesting so i heard something yesterday from 1995 some kind of you know bit of thing that i don't know what it was it was some jam session in a studio with a hammond organ and a piano it's like a time capsule. And I how, love that about recordings. How much of a piece of music do you have to listen to to get it? I mean, I can skim drawings and get them in a nanosecond effectively, but to go through your catalogue of music, there isn't a shortcut. There isn't a symbolic thing that conjures a whole piece, or is there? You mean previously recorded things going through the pa the past? Yeah, you've got a whole bunch yeah. of cassettes or CDs. Do you have any way of marking them so you'll know what the content is? I mean, they're titled and they've I've digitized a lot of those, you know, DAP tapes and things were then put on onto the computer. Um, but no, it's quite it's quite random. But I quite like that aspect of it as well because I'll just go, "What's that?" You know. And then it'll play and I think, God, yeah, okay, interesting. Even if I never use it until the end of time, it might inspire something or I might, I don't know, hear 
where I was trying to go with it, you know. It's all fascinating to me. It's all part of the journey. I, I, I always think actually, quite often artists will, will play me stuff in the studio and they'll say, oh, we're gonna record this better later. And I'll say, but that sounds great because it's you. It's it, that, the, the demo quality I always quite liked about people's. Yes. And that's why the White Album is so great. Yes, yes. Because it's kind of, it's a scrapbook, isn't it? Well, if I would use again, a, a visual art analogy, a sketch has a kind of speed and excitement that is hard to maintain yeah. in a painting. Painting has something else. It has a different quality, yeah. but that quick mark, that Zen master, light touch on the paper has something that's very special and you need to keep. It's I totally agree. It's almost like the, the, the painting or the record or whatever it is, the final thing is fixed, isn't it? It's like it's been stamped, it's fixed. There yes. you go, don't change it almost. Yeah. So with the demo, demo stage, it's, it's like a, it's, it's open and free. That's what I love about, some demos sound better than the records. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I guess. <laughs> well, if you've got... I mean, I can talk because I actually absolutely worked and chipped away at this new thing that Jeff and I have done for, for weeks and just, you know, it's got to be like, you know, it's got to be the best we can do. This has got to be like the... And from Roger Dean's that Pressure on you. But that's fun too, as well as to sort of try and, you know, make something polished. That's also fun. It's, it's all good, isn't it? I mean, it depends what head you, you've got on at the time. Well, the technology yeah. allows you to polish it in a way that was just ridiculously difficult in the past, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we have, if you think about, you know, the musicians on, on some of the, on, on that, you know, there's a guitarist who was in, I think he was in Suffolk. There was a, a drummer in Norfolk. Jeff was in Wales. I was in Los Angeles, you know. And the mastering guy was in Devon. You know, there's all these people that are all working together harmoniously, thousands of miles apart. And it yeah. makes no yeah. difference because you're, really your intention is the same. Okay, so you're not physically in the same room as somebody, but even that can be beneficial because you're not hindered or you know, you're not worrying about what someone's thinking about, you know, your private noodles and, and I, you know, working things out. So even that's great. We, Privacy. We were working remotely before, but now it has become incredibly refined and polished, hasn't it? The, the processes. It has. I mean, when we started off, Jeff and I working together because he was he was in Wales and I was there. We started off doing that, and a lot of people were, you know, they'd comment about that and they'd say, "Well, you weren't in the same room together. I mean, how does that work?" And they're a little bit kind of, you know, dubious that it wasn't really real then if we weren't in the same room together. And of course, now it's become the norm, and sometimes, you know, you can be ahead of the game, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoa, wait a minute. You were two people in the same room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm, yeah I, got I was going to say, I'm going to pause it now, no more than just that. But well, there was, uh, so um, Pharrell Williams was wearing, a, I think he had a union t shirt on. Well, and I saw Lady Gaga had a tomato. No, not tomato. It was uh, going for the one. No, not going for the one. Tomato. Yeah. That was the yes, the yes logo from Tomato. Yes. Right. Amazing. There was another lady who wore one too. She was wearing a Relair one. It's, it's sure. everywhere. Either spell or pronounce the name. It starts with S H. Uh, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to show this. People say, oh, you idiot. It was. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, it's it's nice. I mean, to be fair, they may have thought they were just wearing a Yes Tribute shirt. So that that kind of is cool too. I mean, I've shown your work to a lot of people in my studio who, uh, you know, are 20 years younger than me and maybe not uh, having grown up with that kind of music. And they love it. They're like, wow, what? You know, they're really <laughs> into it. And I'm, I mean, it's, it was everywhere in my studio because I had all your books and everything and all. Did you? Yeah, sometimes. I, oh, yeah, I, absolutely. Been, been, I've loved it forever, really. And um, sometimes my brother and I would go out to the record store in the 80s, you know, and um, just buy, buy albums because it had one of your sleeves and not even know what was on it. <laughs> and I think the, the, you know, I mean, that I can't wait to see that on vinyl. Sorry? I can't wait to see that on vinyl. It's kind of, you know. Is it going to go on vinyl? It is, yeah. Wow. So when did that come out? The CD came out on the 5th of Feb and the vinyl's out on March 26th because the, because of the COVID situation, the pressing plants are all stacked up. So right. we're behind, we're behind Coldplay. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Fair enough. There you go. <laughs> I, I'd love to do this again, if you're up for it. Yeah, definitely. So it's great. Yeah. It's, um, well, I'm going to send you a list of those um, Robert McFarlane books. That'd be great. I'd love to read those. Yeah. Might, I might have to read the page, you know, a couple of times, but. <laughs> <laughs> See, you, there's a great lyric by um, XTC, that, that new wave band I always loved. And it's, um, you may leave school, but it never leaves you. And there, there's, there's the old fear kicking in again that, you know, I might have to, you know, recite it or something. And yeah. Oh God. You know. I, I remember the opposite end of that thing about having to reread the page. When Freya, my daughter was very young, I would read to her or tell her stories. And I'd say, oh, I gotta stop, I'm falling asleep. And she said, no, no, keep going. And I'd say, I can't love, it's all becoming nonsense. She said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 Brilliant. Yeah, I, I, one of the most lovely things about being a parent, actually, I, I think, when I look back now, the, the reading to your kids is, is just a great thing, isn't it? I always really enjoyed it. Yeah. And it was the, the mania would kind of die down from the day. You know, you could relax yourself a little bit, but also, you know, and then you realise when they're older that how fleeting that was and how great that, you know, I'm glad I did it. Yes, and it was fleeting too. Yeah. Scary, yeah. Yeah. Her mum could read better than me because I'm dyslexic and sometimes the words, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> and they don't have to be vastly complex words. They can be, you know, this or that. It can be that simple. And it, the, the logic of it has gone. I can yeah. see the spelling, I can see it, but what does it mean? You know, it's, and that'll happen. So it's kind of not so much, and I could gloss over it, but it was, it did happen, it does happen. And I suppose when, when you were at school, that would, really wouldn't have been understood at all, would it? It would have been like, not at all, no. What was wrong with him? Yes, that happened. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but the, um, there's a book called The Dyslexic Advantage, which is incredibly encouraging because you do have serious advantages too. It's not all negative. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, a lot of um, really creative people are dyslexic, aren't they? I mean, someone like Richard Branson. I mean, he's flying the flag for dyslexia, isn't he? Really, in terms of you know how to be successful. Do you know some... him, by the way? I don't know him, no. But I've always admired him. I mean, he's he's kind of ubiquitous isn't he you know since I was a kid he's just it's it's you know he's either in a balloon or inventing a new aeroplane or something the guy's amazing yeah 
Yeah. And I, re I loved um, Losing My Virginity. It was a great book. I haven't read it. I ought to. I actually have a copy. Really good. Yeah. I mean, the bits where he's talking about flying over the Pacific in a hot air balloon and losing altitude and seeing the waves rising beneath. It's like, I mean, wow, you know, <laughs> what kind of mad kind of spirit have you got to have to take on that? Amazing. And doing it again as well. Yeah. Yeah. Quite amazing. Thank you, kind sir, for all your time. Yeah, it was lovely, Roger. Really nice to chat to you and see you again, hopefully yeah. in person. It's God. sort of odd for me talking to you like this because we've never talked before. No. And I've always wanted to, but it's never been the right time, has it? There's always been something going on or a fleeting thing. Yeah. Should have done it. Well, if you're up for it, we'll definitely do it again. If I definitely am. Definitely. Brilliant. Thank really you. Enjoyable. Brilliant. Good to see you. It'll take me about 20 minutes to copy this and I'll send it to you. All right. Great. And I'm well, sorry about the Wi-Fi. It transfers it into a, a MP4 file and then I'll send it to you. Great. Look forward to it. That was fun. Thank you very much. See you Have soon. a great day.